to give a version of this talk in a certain limit, the large spin limit, uh, which is the last talk of this con conference. Uh, Sen, probably Joao Penedones. <laughs> and uh, there is a uh, there's some also some work that is in uh, progress uh, with Parijat. So all these people, and um, the the basic uh, uh, the punchline of this is a, a way to calculate critical exponents. This is uh, if you open Wilson and Kogut or look at Wilson's. Uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning work, where he calculated critical exponents. A way to cal calculate critical exponents without using Feynman diagrams. And uh, this is a, a non-perturbative uh, approach. So you don't have to uh, limit yourself to a 4 minus epsilon or a large gen or whatever. In principle, it can give you uh, analytic results so one of the ambitions or one of the big uh, targets would be to get an analytic expression for critical exponents for the 3D Ising model. Um, <clears throat> so most of the talk, I will focus on the 3D Ising model. So this is, you can generalize all, all, all uh, of what I'm going to say to ON, uh, but for most of, of, of my talk, I'll stick to N equal to one. And let me give away whatever we have checked analytically, whatever, what new results we have obtained. Uh, before, I, I, in, in case I ran out, uh, run out of time. So, so what you get are analytic expressions for conformal dimensions. So, so uh, in the usual, the, the canonical example that you have, that, that you'll get when you open wilson Kogut is the lambda phi to the fourth theory in a four minus epsilon dimension for ON. And uh, you, you get uh, the conformal dimensions and the OP coefficients. So OP coefficients are difficult to calculate using uh, Feynman diagrams. And in fact, some of the results which we were obtain, uh, able to obtain very easily are actually unknown in the literature. So there's a conformal uh, dimension of, of this canonical, uh, of the elementary scalar phi, which is related to a particular critical exponent uh, the specific heat, and it takes on the form. So this is n equal to one. So this takes on the form and the series is asymptotic. So all these things we can re reproduce uh, using this approach that I'm going to discuss. These are, these are usually obtained using the standard techniques that we use in quantum field theory. You, you calculate the beta function, you uh, locate the fixed point at a, at a, in the usual way that you would do it, and then you expand. You have to regularize and renormalize and all, all that. Um, so we can reproduce all these numbers uh, using, using this approach. The other uh, low-lying operator so there are a whole bunch of operators. The low-lying operators will be phi, phi square, and the double field operators uh, involving derivatives. Uh, so this also you can, uh, so in order to reproduce this term, you have to calculate a three-loop diagram. So this actually comes from a three-loop Feynman diagram, which we will get without calculating any diagrams. And uh, you can also get these double field operators with an arbitrary number of derivatives. Uh, so uh, these take on the form two minus epsilon plus L plus epsilon squared by 54, one minus six L into L plus one. So this was already known. Uh, uh, so these results are all known uh, in, in the wilson kogut review. But we can also calculate the epsilon cube term quite easily using this approach. And this is something that is new, which actually illustrates how far we can go. Yes. So mu1. 
And at this, at this particular order, it takes on, uh, roughly speaking, a form that looks like epsilon cubed over L square times some number plus C2 times log L. Yeah, yeah, the primary, the primary, yes. And uh, so these are the conformal dimensions which translate into, so at least for the low-lying operators, these translate into measurable experimental quantities. Um, uh, what did I, what else did I wanted to say? Yeah, so you can also calculate OP coefficients. OP coefficients are, for some reason, which are not, which is, which, which are not completely clear to us, are harder to calculate using the Feynman diagram approach. And uh, so these also we can calculate OP coefficients, we can calculate up to epsilon cubed order, so all, all those are new predictions. You can do the same thing for 1 over n as well, so uh, in the large n theory for the sigma model. They're difficult. So there, there's somebody whom, whom I met in Florence, in this bootstrap conference, uh, John Gracie. So he is an expert in calculating perturbatively higher and higher loops, then he told me that he's going to, it's going to take him about a year to calculate, so. so it's not clear to me why. It's not, uh, it shouldn't be that difficult. Okay. We can also get one over n. So this one uh, was a four minus epsilon, uh, so in an epsilon expansion, four minus epsilon, you can also get one over n results for fixed dimension, so d equal to three. Some of the results that are already known we can quite easily reproduce. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, we have some universal uh, predictions for these numbers, which I think Pratim will talk about, uh, which should be valid for any perturbative quantum field theory in, in the larger limit. Okay, so let me just. Uh, quickly review the standard approach to the conformal bootstrap and why that does not or is unable to do all this. So the standard approach to conformal bootstrap, uh, so for simplicity, let's consider four scalar operators and you're considering a four-point function of four scalar operators. So in a conformal field theory, as you all know, you can fix two-point functions, you can fix three-point functions, but four-point functions are fixed up to an unknown function of conformal cross ratios. So if you're if you're considering a Euclidean correlator, then you can use, uh, you can move the operators around and you can use crossing symmetry. So you can either uh, take these two operators close together, uh, uh, take, take their operator product expansion, or you can take these two close together and so on. So these two should be similar. So these, the, these two way, ways of uh, doing the calculation should be similar. And uh, roughly speaking, that imposes this condition that the S channel should be equal to the T channel. And, and th this is a, no a non-trivial constraint. The way that you would go about solving it is to expand each channel in a conformal partial wave expansion. Um, so schematically, you write it as uh, OP coefficients which are labeled by the conformal dimension in the spin times the uh, partial waves. Because I, uh, I'm starting off uh, with identical uh, scalar operators, the delta phi somehow factorizes out, and uh, you get an equation that looks like this. These are also functions of u and v. u and v are con conformal cross ratios. Uh, and the reason why this is difficult to solve is because if you expanded it uh, in some regime, well, considering small u and uh, small v, then the powers that would appear here are different from the powers that would appear here, and you wouldn't be able to make much, much progress. So the analytic results that follow from this approach are quite limited. You can uh, solve this equation in, in the large spin limit, but most of the results that follow from this equation are, are numerical, uh, although they are very, very impressive numerics. For example, they quote, or they say that they have the most accurate estimates of the critical exponents for the 3D Ising model using this approach. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yes. It's not known. <laughs> 
I mean, your positions in India. Yeah, yeah. So, so the by from sol by solving this equation, you would hope to calculate these OP coefficients as well as the spectrum. Yeah. So, yeah. That is the approach that we are going to take, but not from this equation. So it will be a different different way of doing it. How to do what you're suggesting is not known here. Even if you did that, there is this non-trivial power of u by v to the power delta phi here. We wouldn't be able to com equate coefficients. Yeah, yeah. Well, the coefficients are not functions. Yes, but that, that is this function here. The whole thing would have to be expanded in terms of that feedback. Right, and that that is not that's not, that's not known. Yes. No, no, what he's saying is that suppose I, I got a basis and I was able to expand this in terms of the basis that appears here, then I would just expand, uh, equate the coefficients and I'd, I'd get algebraic equation. That's what he's saying. We'll be able to solve a, yeah. Hang on, uh, yeah. So we'll be able to solve a version version of that question in Melon space. Yes. No. Why do you need need them to be positive? We we don't want to do we don't want to do numerics. We want to do things analytically. Yes. Is more, but I, I think firstly, I think there's a problem even in the principle in the sense that I don't think the conformal blocks are a good basis in the sense that they don't have good behavior at infinity and so on. I think this will be more clear at in in the uh, formulation. So, uh, so I'm not even sure that it's a good convergent or a good uh, yeah. way to even expand it in principle. So, so, so when we wrote down this equation, we made use of, so, so this is a crossing symmetry constraint, but uh, these partial waves uh, that were used to expand, they, they were consistent with the operated product expansion. Okay, so in order to choose a basis, you have to ensure that it is consistent with the OPE and it is consistent with the, uh, the uh, and separately you have to impose crossing symmetry. Okay, so that is the philosophy that uh, you you have a basis which is consistent with consistent with OPE and you impose this crossing symmetry condition separately. A long time back, uh, in 1973 or 1973, yeah. These are conformal blocks, so there's some basis of uh, basis with which you expand your your four point function. And those are the conformal Yeah, correct. Now, long time back in 1973-1974, Polyakov um, wrote a paper, which uh, which, which essentially uh, had the key ideas or key ingredients of what I'm going to talk about, and this is a paper that in the modern bootstrap literature is cited. But authority tells me that nobody understands it. So uh, we are going to give you a version of this paper, but hopefully in a comprehensible way. Uh, so the essential idea is that we are going to swap these. So we are going to use a basis where crossing symmetry is manifest, but OP is not going to be manifest. And uh, 
that basis is in terms of uh, what in modern language are called Wheaton blocks or Wheaton diagram. So, we're going to take this, so let's call this A. We're going to write this uh, four point function as some things which are related, some, some coefficients which are related to the usual OP uh, operator product expansion coefficients. Uh, but the blocks that we're going to use are going to be the Wheaton blocks. And I'll make this calculation a, a bit more precise in a bit. So, the advantage of this is that crossing symmetry is going to be manifest. So, what we're going to do is we're going to add the S, T, and U channels. But in doing so, and it'll become clear in a bit, we are going to sacrifice consistency with OPE, and that is what we have to, we have to impose separately. We're just swap, swapping the orders in which things are done. Yes. So, so the basis that we are going to use are the Wheaton diagram. So you have a standard four point function. So this is the Wheaton diagram. You have the T and the U channels. And so let's calculate, or uh, let me go through the calculation of one, one such diagram. So suppose your external legs have conformal dimension delta phi. In terms of the usual block, this could also Yes. So these are three level Wheaton diagrams that we're going to use as the basis. No, no, nothing to do with large n, no ADS CFT, nothing. So this is just a convenient way of, this is just, just, just a basis. Yeah, nothing to do with, yes. So, you can calculate this in the, in the position space, but you can also transform into Mellon space. The way that you transform into Mellon space is to do the following, that uh, so these are functions of u and v. So you write your four point function as some integral, so the, the conformal cross ratios are some uh, functions of position outside that we can pull out. So it will look like this, times some Mellon amplitude, uh, times a measure. Uh, the measure is this. So there's an integral over S and T. And this is over the complex uh, plane. So that re, uh, so these are uh, uh, similar to the mellon barnes uh, contours. And this... Uh, uh, function m of st is what is called a Mellon amplitude. And uh, for a simple case where you have a scalar exchange, you can do this calculation of this Mellon amplitude quite easily. It takes on the following form. So let me just go back to that board. The what? Uh, the, these actually form, uh, these actually uh, is a convenient measure to pull out. So you can, uh, what happens is that this is, this measure factor is invariant under crossing symmetry. So whatever crossing symmetry you want to impose uh, on this translates into imposing crossing symmetry on this. Because they are identical scalars, it works out to be squares. Yeah. Ah, that will become clear. Let me just go over it. So suppose you're calculating that diagram with a scalar exchange. Yes, the so U and V are cross ratios. Yeah, yeah, so this is just follows from, uh, there's some uh, convenient thing that you pull out. You can always do that even for non-identical scalars. You can always, yeah. 
So let's go over that calculation carefully. So suppose I'm calculating the Witten diagram where you have four external uh, identical scalars and we are considering a scalar exchange of conformal dimension delta and spin zero. So what does the Mellin amplitude look like? I'll just write out the result. It looks like this is M of ST can be written as in the following way. Uh, so nu is a spectral parameter uh, and um, sometimes or so this uh, whole thing uh, is called a spectral function but this is just a standard calculation that we are doing. This is a convenient way of re representing it. Uh, this, this can be done exactly. You can do this calculation, this new integral exactly. The result is this. So there is a simple pole uh, in my variables when s is equal to delta by 2 and then a whole bunch of other poles which are captured by uh, uh, a hypergeometric function. So let me just uh, write this out and why I'm writing out this, in, in this entire expression is going to become clear in a bit. So the arguments, uh, so th what happens when you do this cal calculation exactly is that you get a 3F2. Uh, sometimes this is also referred to as the Clausen hypergeometric function. Um, so there are three arguments, so it's 3F2, so you'll have uh, what are, so there are three, uh, three variables or three arguments uh, and then uh, there are two arguments in, uh, for the B, so there are AIs and there are these BIs. And um, this, this 3F2, the, the, it is evaluated for a unit argument, so there are a whole bunch of arguments, A's, B's and Z's, so you evaluate it at one. Um, and uh, so there are two things to observe here is that once you do this calculation, uh, you land up getting, uh, get, getting contributions from this double, double pole. So gamma of delta phi minus s whole square ha has double poles at s equal to delta phi plus n. So when you do this calculation exactly, you, you land up getting contributions from the double pole. Okay, so because this gamma of delta phi minus s square cancels out. And why is that important? It's important because when you have double poles in s, this translates into u to the power delta phi log u terms. And these are not, and these are not compatible with the operator product expansion. Yeah, yeah, u to the power delta phi. Both, yes, that's right, sorry, yes. And there is a simple pole contribution as well, u to the power delta phi and log. Yeah, you don't have these terms. Yeah, when you expand. But we, we don't want to, we, we, we don't want to expand anything. So this was the S channel. You can do the same calculations for the T and U channels. And then you expand it in this basis and you demand that these spurious terms cancel. So you, that's how you get algebraic constraints. So in fact, I can write down the most general form of these. So there are, there are double poles whenever there's an integer. So these are labeled by two integers, M1 and M2. So you want to set the coefficients of whatever multiplies this and whatever multiplies this to zero. Uh, 
Um, the way that we are setting it up right now, not. Yeah, but they, are, they, they will converge how fast it is. So there's another reason why I explicitly wrote the arguments out. And the reason is that uh, this is well defined, 3F2 is well defined only if the sum over the B's, so these are the two arguments, minus the sum over the A's is bigger than zero. And um, uh, if, you, if you just do this in your head, you will see that this is two delta phi minus uh, H. H here is the dimension by two. So this is 2 delta phi minus d by 2. And this has to be bigger than 0 for this expression to be valid. And so this would mean that delta phi should be bigger than d by 4. So if I am in three dimensions, uh, this expression is valid only for delta phi bigger than 0.75. But the numerical value for the uh, 3D Ising model is delta phi is 0.518 dot dot dot. So we have to analytically continue this into uh, domain where it is valid, and that can be done. So you, when you analytically continue, then there's a nice expansion that uh, uh, that this simplifies to. So this is the S channel, uh, that diagram that I've calculated. So this can be written as. Why is this uh, nice? It's because this is an expansion in S minus delta phi square. So the entire problematic terms, the spurious terms is captured by this. So you just need to expand this expression around S equal to delta phi. Keep the constant term, keep the S minus delta phi square term, and that will give you the entire problematic set of terms in the S channel. Is that clear? OK. Right. So. So that is the general philosophy, um, and yes. Right. Right. But we don't want to do that. We want to use this as a basis. That, uh, the disconnected piece we add separately. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the the uh, the view the, the way that we handle the disconnected piece is to simply uh, write. We, we we know the exchange diagram. We have a uh, Mellin space representation of that. We just put simple poles, simple poles at the appropriate location, and we add that. So let me just address uh, this question that Shiraz asked. So uh, can, is there some analog of the 6J? Uh, uh, at least in the particular case that we have ex looked at in close detail, there is. And that particular case corresponds to setting uh, M1 equals to 0 here, and for any M2. So when we do that, oh, here. So the double pole are, uh, double poles are labeled by uh, uh, so, so when, when s is equal to delta phi plus some integer, there's a double pole, and so the terms look like so the, so the double pole when you expand this this will have one over something zero square plus one over zero. So this gives you that so we are labeling those by m one, and there is also these simple poles which we are labeling by. Um, okay. 
So let me just uh, rewrite that. So there is u, u to the bar delta phi plus m1 log u, uh, 1 minus v to the bar m2. So there is also a dependence on v. So the, the calculation that I'm going to show you right now or uh, go over right now is corresponds to m1 equal to 0, but any power of 1 minus v. Right. So the calculation that I just now showed you was when you have a scalar exchange uh, for four identical scalars, but in general you can have any even spins that are getting exchanged here. And so there's an analogous version of this particular thing uh, that you can work out. Um, and this looks like, so in the S channel, when you work that out using the spectral function, which is an easier way of doing that, it looks like this. So there is a, a, an S dependence and a T dependence. The, this, this Q are the analogs of those, that, that expression that I've written down here. But these Q, these capital Qs, which are, which have generic, generically they depend on T, but because I was doing a scalar exchange, there was no T dependence in that calculation, but generally they will be there. They are related to these Mac polynomials, but they are a set of orthonormal polynomials. And these are what are called continuous Hahn polynomials. Polynomials in T. Oh, this, uh, depending on the spin, the maximum degree is L. So this is like a regular behavior that you see. Because you see these continuous Hans, whatever function appear in the T and U channels, now you can use the orthonormality properties and expand it in that basis. So that's the general idea. Uh, these, do I have the explicit expressions? Yes, so they. Actually, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll write it out, no. So they are proportional up to some function. Here there is a dimension dependence, but there is also, uh, so these are actually again related to a 3F2. The arguments that appear here, they do not depend on dimensions. They depend on the spin. And uh, the measure with respect to which these are orthonormal, that's also known, the, uh, the, the, the QL with QL prime is equal to some normalization times delta del LL prime. So there's an equation that we know of this form. Yes. Because there are many such forms. Yes. You have to choose a basis. Yes. Yeah, that is something that we have not uh, uh, looked at much in detail because for a long time we were stuck with doing numerics here and then I think we made some progress in the last few days. Okay. So uh, you can do that. And. Um, They, some, they satisfy some, hype, uh, some differential equation, of course. So there are uh, things that you can write down analogously, uh, uh, analogously in the S and T channels. So you can expand whatever you're doing in the T, uh, sorry, T and U channels. The T and U channels, whatever you're doing, you can expand it in terms of this basis. You'll get something, uh, something that looks like that, plus U. And the idea would be to set QS plus Q, U plus Q, Ut plus Qu, so that equal to zero when you expand around S equal to delta phi. So what you want to get rid of are the S minus delta phi to the zero term and S minus delta phi to the one term. 
So th those, are, those are going to be the equations that you'll get. So these will be algebraic, they won't depend on position. So in particular, the problem that I mentioned in the conformal bootstrap program where there were different powers of positions that were appearing on both sides, that wouldn't appear here because these are algebraic equations. Yeah, so in general, so what I have, I've written it in, so in general it will be some function of S and T, and then you're expanding that in terms of that basis, which you can always do. So the, yeah. Yes. Yes. And um, so in, in principle, in, 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 in particular, Using this orthonormality properties, you can pick out one particular spin in the S channel, and this is important. You can pick out one particular spin in the S channel, you can sum over the conformal dimension of those spins, but only one spin, so for example, you can, uh, you, using this orthonormality property, you have only the spin zero contributing in the S channel, but there'll be an infinite number of spins and conformal dimensions that contribute in the T and U channel. Yeah, I mean, because you know the, you, you can do it explicitly, yes. So, just, yeah, because you're, so how would you do that in practice? So suppose we go back to this example. So I wrote down an expression that was in terms of S, and then I told you that there was some spectral function we are writing it in terms of, some, you write it in terms of some integral over mu square minus delta minus h square, right? So there was some QL. And uh, so to go to the T channel from this, just, just for, from this expression, you would just replace S by some function of T. So in, in, in the normalizations that we have done, to go to the T channel, you take the S channel expression, do this replacement, you get the T channel expression. And that T channel expression you can re-express re in terms of that. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So there's an integral, there's an explicit form that you can write down. Whether you can, then in order to make progress, of course, uh, you have to ask whether these equations can be solved after that. Any of them. Uh, so all conformal dimensions and all spins usually appear. So this is a resummation. There's a summation. Over. Um, in, in, Uh, I mean, there could be uh, uh, arbitrary states that appear in the other channel, uh, but these are physical states. So we are we are starting off with an expression that, in the S channel, that sums over the f the physical states in the spectrum. Yeah, sorry, I, sorry, I'm probably misunderstanding. Yeah, suppose we take one of these guys. Yeah. Right. Now, why should the A2 have particular So, so, so the T-channel expression in general, there will be a summation over delta and L which we don't know of. We have to, we have to, I mean, it could be a continuous thing. But they are physical states. But you're not taking expression, No. No. The S channel basis. Oh yeah, uh, these uh, these have the OP coefficients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unknown OP coefficients, which these equations will. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the, 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 the summation. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, his question is, uh, so there is some C delta L here. Suppose I pick out C delta comma zero. So here, not just C delta comma zero will appear, but everything will appear. Oh, the fact that you don't have any S minus delta phi to the zero term, so there are no spurious terms like this. Yes. yes. Correct. Uh, sufficient to do what? So this is sufficient to get rid of the spurious terms. Yes. But but the basis that we are using already has crossing symmetry. So the result that you're going to get will be crossing symmetry. Yes. Spurious term, some spurious term vanishing, yes. Yeah, but. Yeah. Can it be done? Yeah. Okay, so. What, how how does this uh, approach, why is this approach more, uh, how, how does it in, uh, yield all these results that are not possible uh, in the other approach? Uh, so, of course, in order for this to be uh, useful analytically, you have to get rid of this following feature that in the other approach, if you wanted to reproduce the contribution of one operator here, typically you needed to sum over an infinite number, number of operators on the other side. There was no expansion, at least nobody has pointed out any expansion that maps one operator here to one operator here. On the other hand, these set of equations, there is a natural expansion, which is the four minus epsilon, the epsilon expansion, which pr does precisely that. So you have one operator in the S channel, which could be a double, double field arbitrary spin operator. That contribution is exactly produced by an, one operator in the T and U channels. Up, at least up to a certain order in epsilon. So after a beyond a certain order, it becomes difficult to extend, extend. but all these uh, results that I, I talked about, these new results, as well as the, uh, as reproducing the old results of Wilson, the way that it works is that you have some double field del operator in the S channel, plus T plus U. So in order to get this consistency condition here, S minus delta phi to the power zero, S minus delta phi to the one here, it turns out that up to a certain order in epsilon, it is sufficient to re retain only the five square operator in the T and U channel. So that is where the power of this method comes. Oh, that is because there are certain non-trivial cancellations. So if you suppose you you try to ask uh, what is uh, what order of epsilon are you going to get if you retain some other operator? There are some, there are some non-trivial cancellations uh, that happen, uh, which uh, which restrict it only to five square. The way that it works is that. I mean, at least the way that uh, we have understood it till now, but there, there's probably a better way of saying this, is that there's a spectral function approach. Uh, so this, this, this spectral function, this m nu, actually has uh, double poles uh, at various places. Uh, so I'll write down the double poles that happen. Uh, and, uh, so suppose you were interested in a, in, a, in a spin field. So it corresponds to, delta corresponds to say, I don't know, D minus two plus L plus some small uh, A times epsilon or something like that. So that, that will be the conformal dimension of a spin field that is close to the free theory. And that would naturally uh, be there in the T and U channels. Then this contribution uh, actually gets canceled by contributions from here, uh, here, sorry, where? A from here. That's how it works. So you could you could try to put this in, and then you'll realize that the order at which the naive contribution starts gets suppressed because of the, the, there being another an, another double pole here. Yeah, actually, it requires both. It also requires n equal to one here. So it cancels with this and. Then equal to one piece here. Uh, 
That's, that, that's, how, that's, uh, that's how exactly it happens for, for the S equal to T case, yes. Sorry, sorry. I mean, in order to do what you're saying, you require to convert the sum over an integral and then also uh, require that the anomalous dimension is small. There, there are no lock loss criteria. Yes. Right. 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 When you expand the U small power. Yeah, we never have Yeah, yeah, the basis is in terms of tree level written diagrams. We don't ever include any loops in the. I think this program is quite general. You can use this Wheaton diagram as a basis for any correlator. But whether the explicit expressions are known, that is a different question. I think explicit expressions are known only for a few cases, for a few few spins. And general expressions are probably not known for hardly. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, in, in, in terms of the spectral function, yeah. yes. In terms of the spectral function as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a basis, whether it's a good basis is different. I mean, for example, the usual, the original basis that you would try to expand did not have any double pores. And it turned out that it was useless uh, for this kind of calculation. So if you, yeah, yeah. So if you, if you, if you, uh, uh, if you asked, or if you use the right basis, probably you'll be able to go much further. It's not necessary that this is the only thing that is. Uh, uh, I think Rajesh mentioned this, whether this is the most efficient basis or not, I mean, for, for this, clearly, it is quite efficient, at least up to a certain orders in, in the perturbation parameter. Yeah. Yeah, you could you could set it up, except except the the fact that you're using the orthonormality property of these. That uh, is a feature of Mellon space. Sure. Yeah, I mean, when 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 we talked last, or when I came to. Yeah, if I lost, uh, I was doing it in positions. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so you start off with this condition where uh, you can pick up a particular spin contribution from the S channel. So, uh, you forget. So, what happens is that there's a double sum over delta and L, that gets restricted only a sum over delta. And the leading contribution in, a, so you require an expansion parameter. In the epsilon expansion, the leading contribution in the S channel are these double field operators, which look like these. And then, uh, so there are expressions that are known for T and U. So you, uh, so those expressions, they have, the, the spectral function in those expressions have additional poles, which are not there in the S channel expression. So these double poles, because of uh, because of normalizations, there are certain additional factors like this, which cancel out in the S channel expression. Okay, so so that is why the T and U channel expression, there are additional poles which can cancel the physical poles. Me, uh, so, so okay. So there was no uh, okay. I mean. Uh, that's, that's a good question. So uh, uh, let me just reinterpret that question. So, uh, so I've given you a bunch of equations, and then I, I'm telling you uh, some 
perturbative expansion which enables me to solve that equations up to a certain order. In fact, there is another, uh, we have looked at that briefly, there are other expansion parameters, not just four minus epsilon. So you can actually be, be, be at fixed dimensions. One over n is another expansion parameter that you can do. You can reproduce some features of the, uh, the conformal dimensions, known conformal dimensions. But there are, th there is at least one more interesting case where you can, uh, you can, you can solve this up to a certain order. And that is if you're expanding in terms of these, the specific heat. So you treat alpha to be small and you, and you expand that. So that is also a useful expansion. You can do it, do it at least up to a leading order. And then the solution that we get uh, apparently corresponds to the long range Ising model, not the short range Ising model. But, but really whether you can continue that arbitrary, to arbitrary orders, that is a harder question to ask. Yeah, so you, you can ask these interesting questions once you have these equations, are there other expansion parameters that are, that we would normally not use? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm done. Thank you for, yes.